At this time, uh, we're going to have week five of our testimony. Michael Otto is going to come up here. Um, but one other quick reminder, and that is next week is the final week of this series on fear, fear of the Lord, and it is the week that I do not have a designated person to give a testimony. And so while I'm not necessarily asking for you know, five of you to give a lengthy testimony, it is now going to begin a, a time where the floor is going to be open. And what I ask of you is that you consider how God is working in your life today. It could be a story that you've shared how God has touched you in the past, but more than anything, what I long to see in the testimony, and I think as I've heard back from you during these last four weeks, the power of the story about how God is influencing us, and it's a realization we are not in this alone. There are others that have walked the journey that we are, are headed for. So with that in mind, I'm going to turn it over to Michael. Thank you for being here. Too, Pastor. I'm going to try it without these first. Um, many of you are aware I have an ear issue of every sound, including my own voice, is too loud. And it makes my ears shut down. This is the, my first time in church since November because of that ear. Um, I've been spending the extra time with the Lord each Sunday morning and having my own time of worship. But I'll tell you, <laughs> tears came to my eyes back there, hearing the songs and so forth. And I'm always amazed how the songs fit perfectly with what I want to say, and I'm sure they're going to fit perfectly with what the pastor's going to say. So, the pastor asked me to give my testimony, and he's speaking on fear, and then particularly about the issue of loneliness. If it wasn't for fear, I don't think I would have accepted Jesus Christ, or at least that's the way I came to Jesus Christ. I accepted Jesus Christ on Halloween night, 1963, because of the fear that was being put into me by a bunch of junior high guys that were chasing after me, screaming that if I didn't stop and give them my candy, they were going to make sure the devil got me that night. Well, do I look like I'm going to give up my candy? <laughs> no. That fear was enough to drive me to ask Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. And the, the, the truth is, is that fear pretty much in this world has rules just about every area if we live. And my testimony is that, I mean, we all have various testimonies we can give, but I wanted, and I asked the Lord to, you know, give me the ability to be vulnerable and share. I think I've made a lot of decisions. I made the decision to accept Christ, and I think I've made a lot of decisions throughout my life because of fear. We, every day, choose to do this and that, and sometimes we fear what others are going to think. We fear spending money improperly. We fear, uh, you know, making the wrong choices. I was at uh, Bethel uh, way back in the day, and I bring this up because my friend, uh, a friend of mine, is here today that we played football together. And uh, we literally butted heads. He was an offensive tackle, and I was a defensive lineman. And I bring this up because I left Bethel out of fear. I wasn't doing very well as a student because I didn't know how to study. I was afraid of wasting my parents' money. And it, it was a hard, hard decision. But that fear drove me to enter the military. And that fear of what all, everything that that fear brought into my life just like Jesus Christ came out of fear. I can't tell you how many things in my life, including having medical coverage, being a veteran, and just all kinds of associations with that decision. I, I feared so many things throughout my life. And I made choices, and I many times turned to God for the answers of what I should do. But the truth is, I was looking out at to what the world 
was pushing me into. I'm afraid that the fear that God, in fact, I know because I've shared this with several pastors and we've talked about this COVID thing, the fear that God is entitled to because he's God. The, the enemy, Satan, has chosen and through this COVID thing has truly taken the fear that God's entitled to and turned it to we're all looking out in the world at all the things that COVID and other things, all those things that bring about fear. And it's part of fear is feeling as though we are alone. That we don't want to be alone, we don't want to feel what we feel, and we think we're the only ones that feel it. I think Satan has isolated people because of this fear to the point, and I'm not saying we shouldn't wear masks, I'm not saying we should be uh, disrespectful to one another. I think we need to treat it with the respect that it requires, but we also need to be cautious with other things as well. But the loneliness that can absolutely paralyze you is when we're looking totally to what this world has to offer or what this world has that we should be afraid of. There's nothing wrong with being alone. I've had to sit, through the summer, I had to sit with these on in my own home because the air conditioner was too loud. And I started feeling so alone until I started, I purposely went and got a book of sayings from Helen Keller. Helen Keller never saw a sight and never heard a sound. I mean, talk about feeling alone. Yet her sayings are not full of fear. They're full of hope. And my testimony, I'm going to keep it short because Pastor asked me to. And if those of you that know when I preach, I'm not the long, most long-winded, but I could keep I can I could keep going if I had to. But the truth is, I want you to remember this. The breaking point, the breakthrough point for me this summer was when I read those things and so forth, and I truly understood beyond anything that the fear that I was putting this way needed to go this way. What was the first hymn we sang today? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. And I turned my eyes back because I realized I was looking out this way. Out. I wasn't able to go to church. I can't eat in a restaurant. I can't go to a lot of places. I lost my part-time job at uh, my corporate chaplaincy because of this year. But I realized that it was still part of God's will. And in the minute I was able to understand that he knew what I was going through, that it had a purpose, that I turned my fear from this world and turned it to realizing there could be so much more that could be worse. Here. Now you say, well, you have Jesus in your heart, Michael, you shouldn't feel alone. I researched that, and if you know me, I'm in 14 or 15 books at a time. I went, Lord, why? I still feel a little emptiness at times. I believe with all my heart that, and scripture I think will back me up, that we're not going to feel absolutely 1,000% complete here on earth. Because we have this longing to be with him. What we see dimly now, we will see clearly there. So my testimony, my witness to you, is no matter what you're going through this morning, don't be afraid. Don't feel you're alone. You don't have to feel lonely. Take your time, turn your eyes upon Jesus, spend time in his word, and he will speak to you in the most powerful way because you will have you put yourself in a position to receive a word from him you'll be in a position to receive love from 
him. I'm telling you, I was at the brink. I was so, so hurt and broken about two months ago. Wasn't it about two months ago, Dad? That I called the VA. I was seriously thinking about checking myself in. I mentally, physically, spiritually did not feel right. And I, I talked to somebody at the VA and it was worthless because they didn't take my faith into consideration. So I literally went diving into several books that God brought into my heart and here was the answer. The truth is, is God put me in a spot to feel exactly what I was feeling because I was in the midst of grief. I lost my father in April, and we've not been able to have a funeral or a memorial service. And with all the losses with my ear and my father and all those things, it was four or five months after the fact. But one of the books specifically said, month five, six, and seven can be the worst for grief because something will bring something up. So all that to say, I know the pain of being afraid, the pain of feeling alone. And I know the mercy and the grace that God provided, the comfort that only He, through the Holy Spirit, could give. Thank you for letting me share this morning. Thank you, Pastor, for letting me Thank you. speak. I love you. I miss you. I'll be around. I, I convinced myself back there I gotta come even if I have to wear these things through the whole thing. So take care. I'm sure that there were others besides me where that just really resonates. Hits home with experiences we've had, even if it's not currently. Um, but I think for many of us it may be a current thing with the fact that we have as a, as a society, kind of separated ourselves or been separated for a variety of reasons. Our scripture this morning comes from the book of Luke, chapter 8, verses 42 through 48, and it will be, as always, printed on the screen. One thing I failed to mention last week is that you do now have sermon kind of notes in there, so if you are a note taker, feel free to use that guide to help along the way. As Jesus was on his way, the crowd almost crushed him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. But no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding around and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. In his book, Six Hours, One Friday, author Max Lucado writes about taking a walk in an old cemetery in his hometown. Many of the graves were of people who had lived and died in the 19th century. Many of the names belonged to children, bearing witness to the difficulties of life on the Texas prairie. One grave he came across struck him rather sharply. It had no dates of birth or death, just the name of a woman and her two husbands. The grave read this, sleeps but rests not, loved but was loved not, tried to please but pleased not, died as she lived. Alone. What a sad testimony to have lived and died alone. Loneliness has reached epidemic 
proportions in our day. While we have more ability and more opportunity to reach out to other people through technology, it has often been said that we are at, a, at the loneliest place, that people are lonelier than they've ever been throughout history. Because loneliness feels, makes you feel an empty feeling inside, we try to answer it, we have to answer it in some way. And this is what we see in the world's response. People trying to compensate for this loneliness through food, or drugs, or alcohol, or material things, or sex, or work. Loneliness cannot be removed by these substitutes. The most foundational thing is our relationship with Christ. Thankfully, through God's nature, he has revealed to us what the antidote is for loneliness. And so my sermon in a sentence this week is this. And so for those of you that are here for the first time, the sermon in a sentence is something that you can take as a summary statement for this message. So that when you interact with people throughout the week and they maybe ask you about what you learned or talked about in church, you can go back to this. God's antidote for loneliness is connection with him and authentic community with the Bible teaching and practicing local church. So what does this look like? First of all, what does loneliness reveal our need for a connection with God? Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 informs us that we were created in God's image. Imago Dei. Yet God is spirit. So in what way do we reflect God's image? And it's the mark that the mark that we bear in the image of God is because of the triune, or we would often you may hear the word trinity, the triune nature of God. His nature. We have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three in one who live in perfect unity. 1 John chapter 5, verse 7 says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. As Michael straight out told us, we all face loneliness in our lives at certain times. Now, there is something positive to be gleaned about learning to be alone with God. And I think he said it perfectly, that there are positives. There's nothing wrong with being alone. Moses spent 40 years in the desert before God raised him up to lead. He's Israel out of Egypt. As soon as God delivered Israel, he takes them out into the desert. David did a lot of time in the desert as well, hiding out from Saul. And the Spirit even drove Jesus out to the desert for 40 years after his baptism. So being alone with God is not a bad thing. Even the thing that we might call a desert experience can drive us closer to God. So while we may not physically be driven to the to the desert or to the wilderness, that is often where fear drives us mentally, to this desert, dry experience. But loneliness over the long term affects physically as well as our, as our spiritual behavior in a negative way. So we need to realize that loneliness is different than being alone. How many of you can say that you've been alone, you've been physically alone, but you don't feel lonely? And maybe on the flip side, to say, you have tons of people around you, and yet you feel, alone, you feel lonely. The Hebrew word that's used is translated as desolate or lonely, and it means one who is solitary, forsaken, or wretched. There is no deeper sadness that comes to someone 
than when we believe that we are alone in the world, that we do not have a friend or anyone who cares about us, and that no one would care if we just vanished from the earth. Now, I want you to consider this unnamed woman that we just read about in our text. She was sick and had been suffering for 12 years. Can you imagine bleeding for 12 years? I cut myself, got to work, I cut myself with a razor this morning. I think I bled for about 30 seconds. But can you imagine for 12 years? Her sickness had isolated her from others. Because of her bleeding, she was considered ceremon- oh, I'm sorry, ceremonially unclean, get that word right here. From Leviticus chapter 13, verse 46, we see that she would have had to leave her home and live outside the camp until she had been declared clean by the priest. She could not go to the temple or be with the other women. She could not sit where the other people sat. She could not, even in her home, because that would make that split, that space of that, those people unclean. If she went out in the public, others had to know that she was unclean, so they didn't touch her. In Moses' day, that meant that when she would go out in public, she would have to walk around saying, unclean, unclean, so that others would know not to come near her. We talk about six foot as a distance. Imagine what she had to be facing. Can you truly imagine 12 years where no one was allowed to touch you? This woman was desperate for her loneliness to be healed. Can you imagine the courage it took for her to sneak in amongst the crowd and then to touch Jesus' hem of his cloak. Can you imagine the greater courage it took for her to answer Jesus? And we, we read, but the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. If we experience loneliness for any length of time, it's really hard to reach out to people and connect with them. When this woman overcame her fear, she was healed. By her example, she was declaring that her health was fully dependent upon God. She was declaring something we might miss here. She was declaring that here is the priest, the high priest overall. That her by being declared clean by Jesus, she could now re-enter society. Whatever the cause of loneliness in your life, and there are a lot of factors, the Christian cure is always the same. The comforting fellowship of Christ. A loving relationship with our Master has reassured and encouraged countless people, countless thousands who have languished in prison and even went to death for His sake. He is, Jesus is, the friend who sticks closer than a brother, who lays down His life for His friends, and who promises never to leave us or forsake us but to be with us until the end of the age. We can take comfort in the words of an old hymn that says it best. (coughs) Friends may fail me, foes assail me, he is with me to the end. Hallelujah, what a Savior. And so our need for Christ And that authentic relationship with God is so vital. But there's another thing that is very important, and that I think that we fall captive to or fall prey to sometimes within the church, and that is loneliness reminds us that we are created for an authentic community. 
with a biblical and practical, practically lived out. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, God established that it is not good for man to be alone. God, his solution, what's God's solution to this? I'll make him a helper, a companion. He brought Adam to, or Eve to Adam, and they became one flesh. We are designed to be in a relationship with God and with one another. This is why loneliness impacts us in the way that it does. I don't like church. I can worship God on my own. I worship alone in nature rather than with a local body. Perhaps you've heard these statements like these spoken with conviction, unsure how to respond. Do we need to be involved with other Christians in a local church in order to effectively serve God? After all, salvation is an individual decision. Why afterwards must we involve other people? What's wrong with flying solo? There's maybe many times where you wonder if it wouldn't just be easier if you were flying solo. Now while it is true that a relationship with God is an intensely personal decision, no one can give us this faith except God. Church activity does nothing to impress God or earn his favor. I hear that nothing that you do within church itself somehow grants you or gives you favor. He loves and favors us based on his, uh, on our faith in his shed blood on the cross by Jesus. Obedience and surrender to the Holy Spirit are an individual decision that cannot be made by others. But, and God will hold each of us accountable for our stewardship with what he has given. However, when we enter the family of God, we are born again. We become new creatures. When we experience the new birth, we are like snakes shedding our old, our old skin. Our spirit inflates with the presence of God, and a new spirit creeps in place or takes in place the old ways. Our desires change. Our outlooks change. Where we lived at once, one time to only live for ourselves, we now have a longing to please Jesus and glorify him. C.S. Lewis said this, if conversion makes no improvements in a man's outward actions, then I think his conversion was largely imaginary. Part of the change is a desire to be with others who also love and serve Jesus. The list of reasons every born-again believer needs to be involved with other Christians is too numerous for me to share this morning. But I will share two. First, the New Testament is filled with admonitions to love one another. The one another refers to other believers. Love is not a noun. It is an action verb. We are to actively pursue ways in which we can demonstrate unselfish love for each other. Secondly, Attempting to walk the Christian walk alone is not a good idea because we need encouragement and accountability that only our brothers and sisters in Christ can provide. When we shun involvement in the local church, we open ourselves to the increasing likelihood that we will live with major blind spots and spiritual strongholds that we may only be mildly aware of. Because solo Christians do not make themselves accountable to others, they have no one to strengthen their weakness or to correct false doctrine they have accepted as truth. Flaws of one who seeks 
spiritual oversight from those can gently guide them back to obedience. A lone sheep separated from the flock is vulnerable to Satan, just as a lone sheep would be in a herd. We are told that Satan walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom that he may devour. Wolves and lions don't usually attack a healthy flock. They wait for the one who lags behind, isolated from the shepherd and the safety of the fold. You see, a solo Christian misses out on preaching, corporate worship times, fellowship, and opportunities to serve alongside one another. Proverbs 27, verse 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. We grow sharper as useful tools for God when we learn from each other, pray for each other, and invest our side, ourselves in the life of others. Local churches offer many opportunities for us to use our gifts, to serve others, and to glorify God. Avoiding such connections weakens the solo Christian as well as the local body. Christians need to involve themselves with one another in order to remain healthy and productive. Satan cannot steal a soul that belongs to God, but he can render our lives uh, relatively useless for the kingdom by convincing us that we don't need fellowship, we don't need encouragement, we don't need to be challenged by someone of faith. He likes to stir up trouble, bitterness, disappointment, pride, and a critical spirit to keep us from the flock. Let me share a quick story off, off here. And it, I was going through a, a period of time earlier in my life that was an extremely spiritually dry patch. And what is interesting to me was what was missing. I was missing the, uh, the encouragement and the accountability from a local church. I'd gone off to school, gone off to college, didn't have family around, and so I was alone. I was lonely. And what I realized is I could, you know, as I came through it probably a year or so later, I could look back and say, yeah, all of these things. I was deceived by Satan telling me, you don't need that. Or people don't miss you. They don't care. You know, who cares if you're gone for a week? Nobody's going to notice, right? And we buy into these lies, and all of a sudden we think, I don't need this. I don't need other people. In fact, maybe sometimes it's true. We all sometimes deal with more mess. We deal with more mess than other people. And so we use that as justification to say, no, that's not me. I'm going to do this on my own. The reality is we're going to spend eternity worshiping with other redeemed saints. What better chance to, do, to start that than now? You are not alone in your loneliness. The witness of people in the Bible, such as Jeremiah and David, testify to the reality that we all experience it. But sometimes being lonely has a purpose. Sometimes loneliness is just a result of the fallen world. The pain of it is real. Know that God still loves you. You are loved so much that while we were still sinners, Jesus came to die. God knows you, and even despite all of your brokenness and unworthiness, Jesus laid down his life for you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Fight loneliness with reading scripture. Fight loneliness by pouring your heart out to God, who listens and hears you. Battle loneliness by bravely seeking out others who are lonely too, and building biblical friendships. We all need faithful brothers and sisters in Christ 
who we can simply do life together. Studying God's word, whether it be in a small group, or fellowshipping, or serving alongside of each other. Last Sunday, I made the decision, along with the volunteering of three other men, that I was going to start with what I'm referring to as a receptacle group. Three men here at the church, and we have set out to, to meet every Sunday morning and dig in to God's Word. Very intentionally. Why three or four, you may say? For transparency and accountability and prayer. We need these things. I need these things. Recall from last week that statistic, the two statistics actually, that 83% of people who you invite to church would come if you, if you were, don't forget the clause, if you were a family or a friend, so it denotes developing a relationship. And then who remembers the statistic about the number of people that invited? Close. Two percent. Two percent. Invite people into your lives. I, I, as I left Sunday morning, I, I, I walked out the door thinking, I need to make sure to clarify that. Yes, invite people to church. But more than that, invite them into your lives. We serve a God who loves, who tells us to love our neighbors and even our enemies by doing good and praying for them. So let's get real practical here. How can you do this? How can you do this where you live, where you play, where you work? Begin by praying for God to reveal to you who it is you are to minister to. Don't skip that step. Start If you haven't been praying for God to bring people into your midst, do it. He's been doing that since we've been here. Go out and meet your neighbors. Keep in connection with people here at the church. Maybe that's your connecting point is that you need to continue to encourage and uplift those in the body. Maybe it's providing a meal for someone who's sick in our community or helping with hands-on projects. Fill in the blank for whatever it is that God may be calling you to do. Men, I'm going to challenge you this morning. Invite a couple of other guys to get together and study the Bible. Could be Sunday morning. Could be another day. Could be people in the church. It could be people that you know who, who need a personal faith in their life. Women, go and do the same. Couples, find another couple and, and dig into the Word. Maybe you're intentionally focusing on what, it, what is required of you in your marriage or with, as you parent. Begin now praying, this moment. Stop listening to me for a minute if you want. Pray. It is that important. Pray for God to bring people into your life, because they are there. So really what you're asking is that God opens your eyes and slows you down and says, I'm not going to just pass you by. As a follower of Christ, you are part of God's kingdom of priests, and you have a role to play. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, Peter wrote, You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. The function of the priests was to connect the Jewish people with God. The law was clear that the priests were to be of the tribe of Levi, which interestingly enough, and I'll say I didn't know this until I studied this out this week, that the word Levi means connect. They were the connection point. And there were strict rules in place about how and when someone could approach God on behalf of the people. Jesus changed that. Mark's account of the death of Jesus on the cross included in a curious statement. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now what's the significance of the curtain? 
This is the curtain that separated the people from the Holy of Holies, where God's presence was said to reside. Only certain priests were allowed into that sacred space. And in ripping open that curtain, God communicated that the old priestly order was done. So that now we are priests, and together we are a royal priesthood charged with connecting people with God. And empowered by the Holy Spirit for that purpose. God's plan is for you to proactively live your life as a, in your priestly calling. So when you're sad and lonely, or when you feel alone, remember that you are called to connect with God and with people. Intentionally living out your calling will help you overcome, overcome chronic loneliness. If there's one thing that you can take away, listen to this next sentence. This is so vital. Your natural inclination, my natural inclination, when you are feeling lonely, might be to pull back and see if anyone will reach out to you. I would encourage you to turn that around. Start by praying for wisdom about who to connect to within your local church and within the community. God is faithful. He will open doors for you to become more connected with your local church family and community. When people come into contact with the divine connection, they will see that God loves them. So God's antidote in this time for our loneliness, whatever it is at its source, is to start with your connection with him, but also playing an active role in being an active, an authentic community member and involving yourself in a biblical and teaching and practicing church. Let's pray.